So for today's reflection, Joe and I are going to present you with a summary of the major happenings at GA, a brief reflection on the experience of serving as a delegate, and then use the remaining time for questions and comments from you all. Could put up the first slide here. So as we work out the thing in the back, I'll go ahead and there it is. Yay. Um, so Pastor Isa pictured here was able to attend UUA General Assembly in person in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And last week, she shared a reflection specifically around the propo proposed amendment to Article 2 that was a major topic of discussion at GA this year. Next slide. <laughs> Joe and I attended UUA General Assembly virtually together, meeting here at UUFM in the Narthex and watching events on our handy dandy owl cart. So I will now hand it off to Joe, who was the major muscle behind the monumental task of summarizing the event for you today. Okay, so this is going to be kind of a blow by blow summary, but by no means an exhaustive summary, just the things I thought were important. So beginning with Thursday. Thursday, I learned that it's very easy to get lost in Pittsburgh. So I'm glad I wasn't actually there. During the land acknowledgement, there was a story about a magic Pennsylvania banjo that no one could play. So you know the secret of the magic banjo. You have to bring out the music that's already inside it. You can't put your music into the banjo. That's the secret. You all can figure out what that represents because they didn't tell us. <laughs> so after that, we had the, the president's report from outgoing president, Susan Frederick Gray, more on that later. And then we had the service of the living tradition, which celebrates the lives of ministers who have passed away in the last year. And the singing that we saw at the beginning of the service today by Reverend Glenn Thomas Rideout, that was from the service of the living tradition. And that was one of Emily's favorite parts of GA. She said, we all need to learn from how this guy leads music with his whole body. So in addition to commemorating all the ministers who have died in the last year, we also commemorated the life of Alandria Williams, a UUA official who passed away in 2020 at a tragically young age. And we had a great sermon by Reverend Christopher Bice. It was a very funny sermon. His theme was the difficulty and necessity of change for us UUs. He said, there's an old adage that organizing UUs is like herding turtles, <laughs> to which one of his colleagues said, mine are snapping turtles. <laughs> but at his home congregation, the board had a little cheer that they used when they needed to get things done. They would cheer, go turtles, go, go turtles, go, go turtles, go. So he, he's trying to popularize that across the association now. Um, we're going to give you a little taste of Reverend Bice's humor straight from the horse's mouth, if we can play the clip. My father, an Episcopal priest of blessed memory, once gave me advice on preaching in the form of a story. And the story goes like this. When Martin Luther was a young preacher, he used to write his sermons out word for word and simply get up in the pulpit and read his sermon word for word to the congregation. Afterwards, a woman came up to him and said, Martin Luther, that's no way to preach a sermon. You don't need to prepare anything at all. All you need to do is get up in the pulpit and let the spirit speak through you. And he said, I did that once. I got up in the pulpit and I heard the spirit say, Martin Luther, 
you should have prepared a sermon. <laughs> so I have come prepared to speak today as all our religious professionals have come prepared to do the work that they do. So that was Thursday. Friday began with the Foz Lecture, named after famous religious educator Sophia Foz. It wasn't really a lecture, it was a panel, but whatever. So the panel challenged us with the following idea. If you're worried about how few children are in your RE room, ask yourself why you don't have more parents in the sanctuary. <laughs> Her message was, you use are not doing enough to support families with young children. And there are people who think of RE as a chance to be away from the kids for 30 minutes. The panel said, if that's what RE is for your parents, you're not doing a good enough job taking care of parents because they're probably burned out on parenting and you, you really need to be doing more for them than just giving them 30 minutes away from the kids. On a similar note, the uh, new president of Liberal Religious Educators Association is of the opinion that RE should be in the second hour and kids should stay in the sanctuary for the whole service. So the entire thing should be kid friendly and kids should stay in the sanctuary. So I'm sure we here can have a lot of interesting discussion about that idea. Um, also on the theme of burnout, the panel addressed the, the perception that many RE leaders across the country are getting burned out. And the antidote to that, they said, is to realize that the important thing is just to get the kids together. We don't always have to have a high effort program. Sometimes if all you can do is let the kids climb on some rocks, that's okay. The important thing is that they're doing something together. So those were some thoughts on RE. One of the uh, panel members, I think her name was Kirsten Hunter, but my apologies if it was not. Um, she had some thoughts on covenant, which was the theme of one of our recent services here. So I thought I would share what she said about covenant. She said that covenant is about saying how we're going to be with each other. And then when we're not fixing it. And her opinion is that if that was the only thing we were doing in our congregations, quote, people would be pouring through the doors. So I guess she thinks it's pretty important. So after that lecture, we had the presidential candidate forum because there was only one candidate, Sophia Betancourt. And it turns out she's against burnout too. She said, uh, one of her colleagues came to her and said, Sophia, we're trying really hard to come back from COVID, but we're only back to 70% capacity. And she said, 70%? That's great. How about you shoot for 40? <laughs> Her philosophy is that it's easier to grow from 40% than to heal from 150%. So given what Emily was saying earlier about lack of volunteerism and possible burnout in our congregation, maybe that's something to think about. Friday also had a worship service. It was the Synergy Bridging Service in which certain young people walk through a ceremonial gate that symbolizes the transition to adulthood. So one of the speakers addressed the perception that when young people age out of RE, they leave the church. And she said, that narrative is not wrong. But she also said, getting young people to come to Sunday service is the wrong goal. And we shouldn't expect young people to fit into neat membership boxes. So that's something to think about too, I guess. Saturday, things started to get really interesting. There were, there were two medical emergencies on the floor on Saturday. As far as I know, both people were okay. And there was a kerfuffle about a young man who was kicked out of GA. And we had the two most interesting floor discussions that day, which we'll get to in a minute. We also had a little interactive activity that I'm going to reenact for you. 
please, as you're able, raise your right hand above your head. Now, put your hand over your face. And if you don't feel a mask, people had to be told again and again about the mask rule. And even when they tried sarcasm, it, it didn't work. They had to tell them again. So that, that was an ongoing story. So on to the floor discussions. The first one was on Article 2 replacement, which we've been talking about here recently. Article 2, if anyone doesn't know, is the section of the UUA bylaws where the seven principles are. And there's a revision in the works. So this is going to be voted on next year, 2024. This year's vote was to let the proposal go on another year or sink it now. So let's see some of the discussion from the floor. Play the clip. Thank you. I'm Michelle David. I am a cisgendered black of Haitian descent from First Parish in Brookline, Massachusetts, the land of the Nupanoag. I have been a UU for 31 years. I wanted to say I'm poor for the change in Article 2 because for the first time I feel seen in the bylaws. Many a time during my 31 years as UU, I've wanted to quit the faith despite my strong belief in, in the principle because I have not felt um, part of the place and I've been a uh, part of leading major diversity initiative at my church, but still it's not enough. This feels that we can address this at the institutional level. Um, and my family is multiracial, multicultural and international. I want to be in a space where we all can be together. I do not want to live in a monoculture, white or black. This is why I still remain new you and I'm strongly advise us to force yes for this changing an article too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle David. I'm sorry, Consite. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Rick Nida. I bring you greetings from the Community Church of Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Unitarian Universalist, the land of the Okanichi. I'm a white male. I'm wearing a light blue shirt, a yellow tie, a blue blazer, and uh, soon to be uh, green rimmed glasses. Let's pump the brakes on this proposal. Uh, at the opening of this GA, leadership abused his privilege from the dais to characterize the skeptics of this revised Article 2 as stuck in the past and the proponents as open-minded progressives. The moderator indicated that more than 800 amendments were submitted. While that could be interpreted as active participation, it could also indicate just how inadequate the document is. The 800 amendments is more than the total number of words in the document. The study group told us that it listened to input, but it must have listened with both ears open, that is, in one ear and out the other. There's little evidence that the study group accepted many of the well-reasoned amendments that were submitted. Most were rejected without consideration or explanation. Only 15 of the most benign were selected for discussion and voted at GA. These undemocratic actions should not be rewarded in today's voting. The study group worked for two years. Let's let it rest for at least that long. We can revisit with fresh eyes, open minds, and more democratic processes. Thank you. 
So during this discussion, we also learned that some congregations had already had meetings to decide how their delegates were going to vote on Article 2. And point of interest, First UU of Wichita apparently instructed their delegates to vote no. So after this, we went on to discussion about the fossil fuel divestment resolution. Now, this was a resolution that would force the UU Combined Endowment Fund to sell all investments in fossil fuel companies and banks that support them and give the money to people of color organizations. So the Board of Trustees was not a fan of this, and they made some videos explaining why they were not. But let's see what people on the floor had to say. Hanse, hello. My name is Rowan. I am a member of the Nehio and Inuk nations. I am also a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Action. But it is not for my church that I speak. I am white passing indigenous with long pink hair and shaved sides worn in a braid. I'm wearing a black t-shirt with pink littering that says fry bread thighs and skoden eyes. I wish I could come here to GA and simply enjoy the conversation that people have. But it's with a heavy heart today that I sit here before you. I am a water defender with my family, with my relatives, and we are dying. It is every day that I wake up and have to check to ensure that the people who I love that are on the front lines are still alive. As Unitarian Universalists, we claim to love every person, to say every person has value, and yet we fund the very organizations that commit genocide in native populations. We have blood on our hands as a denomination, from residential schools to buying the bullets that shoot people in this very room. And so I must ask all of you, what is important to you? Is it our values and our principles? Or is it the blood-soaked almighty dollar? Because as it stands, the only God in this place is money. And that is not my faith. Thank you. I'm Teresa Wilmot, the chair of the investment panel of the UU Church, Rockford, Illinois, the land of the Ho-Chunk people. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a petite cisgender white woman in my 70s with gray hair and glasses. I'm wearing a yellow side with love t-shirt my background is the Renberg window at my church, with the UU chalice in the middle surrounded by six circles with the symbols of six different religions. From where does the money come that the UUCEF invests? While some of it is excess cash, a lot of it is legacy funds, also called endowment funds. Dean Tollefsrud chaired our congregation's Building and Grounds Committee for many years. He loved our building, but realized that it would need care in the future. He dedicated his money after his death, as he dedicated his labor during his life to that cause. The Tollefsrud's estate formed the Building Fund, the part of our permanent funds earmarked for building expenses into the future. Our investment panel has a sacred responsibility to Dean and to all our cloud of witnesses who contributed to our permanent investments to shepherd their donations, earning a reasonable return over the long haul and protecting that principle. We chose the UUCEF fund for about 40% of our principle because it invests in our values, but if this business resolution passes, we will remove our church's funds. 
To allow these requirements to so restrict the investment committee would result in poor returns and extreme swings in value. We would squander the legacy of our cloud of witnesses. Thank you. So that goes on for a couple more minutes. And those young people that you saw protesting, many of them were part of the group that actually wrote the business resolution. It was a very grassroots thing that the board of trustees and those people didn't have anything to do with. It came from these young people. So that was the general session. And then on at the end of the day on Saturday, instead of a worship, we had the wear lecture. This is a very long running GA tradition. And this year's wear lecture was given by the author Imani Perry. She spoke mainly about, well, she spoke about a whole lot of things, but the, 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 the sort of central topic was the life of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, who was a black Unitarian who lived in the Civil War era. And I'll just share a few of the uh, the best pearls of wisdom from the talk. Oh, does someone have a question back there? Well, I want to know what happened on the boat. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> we didn't find out right away, so you don't get to find out right away. <laughs> okay, so a few of the best points from the lecture. First, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was technically free because she lived in the North. But in another way, she wasn't really free because if she went back to her home state, she could be re enslaved under the Fugitive Slave Act. So Perry said, This is a metaphor for many people today technically free, but not really free. Second, she said that we don't realize how much of our knowledge was created by forgotten people. For example, it was once thought that a white woman discovered how to grow the indigo plant, like commercially, but actually it was her slave that taught her how to do it. And third, she said, social movements are remembered for their splashy moments, but what makes that possible is a consistent way of life. And there was a lot more in the lecture, so you can watch the rest of it if, if that sounds intriguing. Sunday, we found out the results of the voting. And Emily and I were surprised to find out that apparently about a fifth of the delegates didn't vote, so we don't know what that was about. But four fifths did, so there were results. And Article 2, preliminary approval, got 86%, so that passed, and it will be voted on again next year. Fossil fuel divestment did not pass. It got 32% of the vote. There were also three position statements. Organizing for health equity, rise up to stop cop city, and protect the dreamers. These are not business resolutions. They don't formally commit the UUA to do anything. They're just position statements. Those all passed. Protect the Dreamers passed with 98% approval. And 
new president Betancourt was elected with 95%. So then what happened was they had a laying on of hands ceremony for her and that was pretty much the last thing. So the moderator said, since we no longer use Roger's rules, Robert's rules, sorry. <laughs> we, uh, we don't need a motion, a second or a vote to adjourn. So we're adjourned. <laughs> and that, that was uh, the highlights, in my opinion. Right? Thank you, Joe. For that well rounded summary. That was a lot. And it was also just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are a lot of things that we participated in, such as workshops and also ones that we couldn't go to. There's all sorts of resources and other happenings and dynamics that are available to experience at UUA General Dis Assembly. Uh, so that's just a, a tiny taste. So a lot happened. And as delegates, Joe and I put a lot of effort into taking in as much as we could and representing our community as well as we could. And here are a few brief reflections on my experience as a delegate, many of which came out of discussions I had with Joe and Pastor Izzo, who we kept in contact with um, during the event um, as we were going through it all together. I noticed a personal and what also seemed like could be a communal learning curve uh, which is uh, understanding UU history and culture as people who came to it much later in life. We also noticed that there's some very specific UU language that is used very consistently at GA that we don't really use here. There also seemed to be somewhat of a disconnect uh, with UUA happening, uh, UU, that UUFM seems to have a little bit of a disconnect from major UUA happenings and the larger UU conversation. We're very, I mean, this is kind of just being in the middle of the country. Um, but we're just aware that we didn't know there was all this happening, you know. <laughs> um, and we had some questions that came up as well which is who are we to represent when we're serving as delegates? Are we voting our own conscience? Are we voting based on what our community would want? And how would we know that? Um, so just a, that's just a few brief thoughts.